Hi, Richard and Susan. Welcome onto the podcast. Great. Thanks for having us. Thank you for having us. Um, It's a real pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us. And I am really excited to share your story and uh, particularly this case study that you're going to share with us today, which I've been able to have a sneak preview of, which is absolutely fantastic. So it's brilliant to have you on the show. Guys, to kick us off, and I know this is your first podcast, but I'm sure it will not be the last. (laughs) Can you tell us a little bit about yourselves? Who are you um, and kind of what does your property business currently look like? Yeah, Yeah, so uh, I'm Susan and together with my husband, uh, we run Resolution Property Investments um, and it's literally been running for three years now. We've started doing a flip um, and then now we are currently looking into HMOs. We've got three HMO projects at the moment, so we've been really keeping very, very busy with that. Um, And we also have an, an interior design company joined to that as well. And and that might explain why the pictures of the property that you recently finished, which really caught my eye, um, are so amazing. And it's a beautiful property and it really did kind of jump out. And, there's a lot, and that's saying something because there's a lot of great stuff on Instagram and social media now, but yours really caught my eye. Um, so you guys are obviously um, from another part of the world and have found your way to the UK. Is there a story behind that? Is there a decision that kind of um, that you had to make or wanted to make to come into the UK? And, and when was that? Yeah, um, it. I think, you know, we being from South Africa, there were a lot of benefits. But I think looking forward in terms of our family life, we had a, a two year old girl and we were just thinking of her future, and uh, that was that was really uh, the motivation behind our move. And we decided if we're going to to move out of South Africa, we, we'd need to do it sooner than later. Uh, and we did that in 2017. So yeah, it was about five years ago. It was a tough decision, leaving friends and family behind, but we thought it was the right decision in the long term for for our family. So that was the basis of it. And I suppose we'd, we'd had a bit of property experience in South Africa uh, and not really considered South Africa in terms of, of property investing in the long term. We'd, we'd done uh, a bit of home renovations, um, uplifted the value of our own property and sold it on, you know, and we were very happy with, with the result of that. And then, yeah, moving into to the UK, we were kind of still interested in property, but didn't realize the, the full scope of it until we decided to get ourselves educated. And that just opened up a whole new world for us. Wow. So, I mean, that, that must have been, a, like you said, a huge decision. And had you already had it in mind that you, you, you would come and consider investing in property in the UK? Or was that something that happened afterwards as you kind of got settled in? It was, it was afterwards, I would say. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, we came over to the UK based on the fact that I was able to secure full-time employment. Um, I got a job here. And it was while we were here that we, we started, you know, considering property again and that we, we started renting a house first. Uh, and as soon as we could, we wanted to buy our own home because that was always um, our core belief is to, to own our own home. So we, we understood from that point of view, you know, having having a, an asset in terms of that uh, was was the first thing we wanted to do. And then we started thinking about or, or yeah, got exposed to the, the possibilities in terms of the, the strong demand in terms of rental market here and and that's when we we got ourselves educated in buy to lets and then discovered this thing called hmos <laughs> which <laughs> is a completely foreign concept to us from south africa mm. um in fact um susan actually experienced hmos herself yeah. back in south africa <laughs> there is no such thing as an hmo so it's very very um foreign growing up with that whole concept. But um, in my younger days, I I did a two year stint in London and stayed in some very questionable (laughs) HMO myself. And uh, when we first heard about this, I was like, hmm, we really don't want to be producing things that what things that I stayed in. Um, And we really wanted to sort of raise the standards of what our tenants would be living in. So um, yeah, we really thought um, that HMOs was um, really interesting once we got into learning a lot about it. Um, and then from a, from a business point of view, we figured out that, you know, we actually need a lot, um, we need a lot less properties to get to, to our financial goals. So that was also the other, the other thing that we, we liked about um, sort of HMOs. 
Yeah, well, um, I mean, there's no doubt at all that you've created something that is vastly different to, to the accommodation that you experienced um, back then, Susan, because what you have and are creating now is, is really incredible. Um, so you guys did a bit of um, standard residential stuff before you got into the HMO stuff. I think you've done a buy to let and maybe you flip something. Is that what you've done before getting into the HMO market? Um, yes, before getting into the, the HMO market, uh, as I mentioned, um, we'd done our own home renovations. So that was essentially a flip. Uh, it was a live-in sort of flip. We did, we did an extension, a rather large extension added a swimming pool uh, because you can in South Africa. <laughs> and, uh, um, from that point of view, that was our, our first flip essentially. Then once we got into the UK and educated ourselves, that's when we then took from a theoretical point of view, we put that into practice and, and did our first uh, flip here in the UK in Nottingham. And then we were, you know, as, as part of the education that we'd received, um, you know, there's, there's this sort of pyramid in terms of property investment advancement in, in growing your skills as you as you sort of move along and and buy to lets would be the sort of baseline to start from and we'd always been looking for buy to lets um, with the radar on for flips and we actually found a flip project and and we worked on that but we were always looking for buy to lets in the background and just found it very difficult um, in terms of of, of getting offers accepted, first of all. I think it was, you know, we, we started in, in, in a period in time in, in the property cycle where, where, where prices were, were fairly high. Our, our low offers were not being accepted for, for a buy to let to work. I mean, we were very, very grateful that we got the flip offer accepted. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was an absolute gem that we found. It was, it was an absolute wreck. We got it at a good price and, and we sold it for a great profit. Mm -hmm. But in terms of buy to lets, we just weren't really winning. And that's where we thought, well, maybe we need to start considering HMOs because we could potentially provide a higher offer because we're then adding more value to it. Uh, we can increase the GDV because we were looking at potentially um, using commercial finance rather than standard uh, mortgages and that's that's kind of how we we kind of skipped a step so to speak <laughs> and and progressed onto onto HMOs well I can see a number of challenges immediately there with this so you guys have come over from South Africa and I imagine just off the bat things like getting finance and approval for credit and things like that is, is is also tricky were those the sorts of obstacles that you were coming up against as well as the difficulty in finding deals or is actually that is it a bit easier are the solutions around all of that i think we were yeah that that was a challenge when we bought our own home and we just managed to do that um within the first year of moving here so we, we were able to to sort of create a, a credit record and, and purchase our first home um, which would have helped us for the buy to let, which we didn't do. Um, <laughs> so uh, in terms of HMOs, yes, there was certainly a challenge there, uh, as most lenders would want to see some HMO experience. But what we ended up doing, and, and it might not necessarily have been to our benefit, might have added more complication <laughs> to, the, to the matter, but this is, what, this is the way we, we had to progress, and that was have a joint venture partner with us. Um, so we had a financing partner who provided all the capital for, for the project. We formed a joint venture, uh, registered a limited company um, and applied for finance based on that limited company. So it wasn't necessarily directly, uh, we weren't scrutinized directly as the lenders, it was more the, more the company. And they obviously take into consideration the, the directors of the company. Um, so uh, the complication was that he was an international investor from South Africa, but he had ties to the UK. He had a bank account here in the UK. Mm -hmm. uh, he had a he had dual nationality, so he was he was a UK resident as well. So that kind of helped. Kind of helped us, you know. But also the lender saw that as a difficulty. So it was a bit of a challenge mm -hmm. um, getting getting the finance. But I think the main difficulty for the finance was we we started during COVID <laughs> and that, that's where the challenges were. <laughs> and, that, and that certainly brought a lot of challenges. So um, did you guys come over with some resource, um, some capital to use and invest straight away? Because I noticed immediately, almost off the bat, you're talking about working with private investment, which is um, really great to hear because I think a lot of people often feel like you need more experience or more time to have done it. Um, and it sounds like you did that relatively quickly. Was that JV a collection of, of, of your resources and theirs, or were you 
almost exclusively financing the first deal with with private investment yeah so that was um exclusively with that investor he provided the the finance um and was from south africa and being from south africa was obviously a connection and a, and a somebody that we knew well um so i think that's the important the important thing about joint ventures is 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 it's got to be you know, there's got to be a, a good relationship behind that. It's not just purely business. There, there's also got to be um, a relationship and understanding and agreement from both parties. So I think we were fortunate in the, in that um, we were able to get private investors uh, quite soon, not having a, a major network here in the UK, but from from a South African uh, connection. And in fact, our second joint venture partner is also from South Africa, but living abroad in Dubai. So um, that. And, and, and yes, from a resource point of view, we, we're then providing the, the, the sort of skills, the knowledge, the expertise, you know, following on from our experiences as well as our education that we do. Um, and are you working with these investors on a debt basis, just paying fixed rate returns, or are you sharing the capital and the actual profits of the, of the project? It's, we've structured it as a 50-50 arrangement. Uh, I think it's the simplest way to do things. You know, uh, they provide 100% of the funding. We provide 100% of finding the property, negotiating the deal, getting it across the line in terms of purchasing, designing the HMO layout, um, getting build quotes, choosing the builder, pointing the builder, managing the build. And so, getting so, the tenants. <laughs> and then all the way to <laughs> getting the tenants, collecting the rent. So, yeah. you know, so... We've, we've had we've had some potential investors say well i'm putting on all the money what are you putting in you know it's like well actually <laughs> if we, you know if we you know it, it's actually quite a large part of the project and I, and and we felt 50 50 is is it's quite fair, fair. Yeah. And, and we've seen a lot of other joint ventures based on that basis so so it's i think it's been received quite well with our partners and that's the way it's, it seemed to have worked quite well with us and we've we've done that with with two joint venture partners and with one of them, we've got two properties. So, yeah. Well, it's great to hear you talk about um, the way that you're working with investors. And so were these investors, were they people in your close network back over in South Africa? Were these people that you already had established relationships with? Or did you, you know, was this from a kind of a standing start trying to find new private investment from new individuals, you know, that just happened to be in South Africa? How did that quite work? Well, the one, the first investor was somebody that I knew from South Africa. Yeah. Uh, in fact, it was my university lecturer. <laughs> okay. Um, and the second one is a, a connection through Susan. Really. Yeah. So it was just literally once we get started um, in property, we literally told everybody what we were doing. Um, and a lot of people were very excited. Um, everyone seems to be interested in property on some level. Um, so it was easy conversation to have with most people and we just used also social media, getting out there, telling people what we were doing. Um, and yeah, a friend reached out to me and said that they would be interested in, um, and of course they've been watching us, they've been seeing what we're doing and they, they thought, well, this sounds like a really good idea. Then obviously we had the conversation, um, which is very important, especially when you are doing a JV, you really want to be able to make sure that your goals are aligned um, and that of course you first and foremost like each other because of course you will be dealing with um, certain in instances and some situations that you'll obviously won't necessarily go the right way and lots of challenges so you need to be able to be problem solvers and you know come together and work together so after a, a few conversations um, yeah they were they were happy with what we were offering them and at this moment, you know, all of our um, partners are very happy with us. So it's been great. Um, just fantastic to be able to share resources. I think it's very important that you, you know, property is really tough. You don't want to do it on your own. And I think building those relationships and working together and pulling um, each other's strengths is really, really key to the success of um, property deals and property in general. I, I think so. I, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. So I, I think this is a really interesting point to, to to labor on because I think finance or lack of finance is a barrier that 99% of people who are investing in property or investing in HMOs particularly will at some point face, whether it's when they're just getting the first one or the second or the third, fifth, the 10th. It doesn't really matter because at some point that finance will run 
would run dry and you'll have to look at options if you want to keep growing and scaling that business at how you bring it in and, and private finance as well as high street is it's certainly in my experience the single best way to do it and you guys make it sound really easy <laughs> <laughs> but susan if, if you were to give somebody some advice maybe where you were a year or so ago a couple of years ago just getting started recognized that investing in hmos was was going to be a, a really good thing to do but didn't quite have the finance to make it work or to to, to scale it quickly enough where would you suggest they started? And, and I guess I want to draw on some of your experience of, of, of doing this so so effectively in such a short space of time. Yeah, so essentially when you are talking about money and investment, I think a major thing is trust um, and people need to trust you. So I think the first port of call was to, to work with the network that you already have Mm -hmm. um, I think that was probably where we started because people knew us for a long time. You know, we're credible, we're trustworthy, um, and you know, you know, we're quite, quite flexible, and we we could offer a lot from that perspective. So mm -hmm. I think that's probably um, where we started. Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't easy <laughs> having the conversation to your friends about large sums of money is is quite tricky, but. At the end of the day, um, it was all about finding out what their needs were, what their wants were, and aligning what we could do with them. Um, mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, we're all about win-win situations. It's it's got to be beneficial for both both parties. And then, of course, we widen our pool. So it was definitely about networking, um, going to network meetings. You know, we had joined a, a property community as well, where we've connected with so many people that, um, you know, are also on this journey as well. And again, pulling resources from, from different people, whether it's financial, whether it's knowledge, whether it's experience. That's also been really, really good to, to just network. And then, of course, you know, it'd be silly not to use our social media. I mean, mm -hmm. that's pretty much where a lot of business is taking place right now. So, you know, we need to work with the times and utilize them to, um, to our benefit. Um, so I think that's also been really, really great in, in showing people what we do day to day. Um, that property is not just you know, on the uh, buying and selling property, there's a lot more that is involved in that. There is. I think you've just shared some brilliant advice there, Susan. And um, did you recognize raising finance as, as a top priority? Because often something that I see is people recognize that it's going to be important, but don't actually prioritize the action to go out and find it. Instead, prioritize um, the granular bits and pieces, um, perhaps don't try and open the doors to actually sit down and have meetings with investors or create things like investor decks or even develop a brand that generates some interest and attraction. Uh, and sometimes I don't see people actually talking about what they're doing or their intent on, or, you know, their intentions in, in property. And of course that makes it difficult for people to actually see and engage and, and show any interest in, in you or your business. So did you guys, Obviously, you recognise that, that this was an important part, but did you also recognise that this was a key priority for you? And, and did you really sit down with a, with a str strategy and an action plan and, and say, this is what we're going to do? Well, at the beginning, um, we were just kind of looking at our own resources. And we thought, oh, well, um, with a buy to let, we can get a mortgage and we need to come up with a deposit and the refurb. And we kind of said, well, this is kind of the money that we do have towards that. Um, but then later on realized that that was very, very limiting. And if we wanted to do bigger projects, we needed to, to work with um, investors. Um, yeah, it wasn't... It was, it was probably only later did we realize that mm -hmm. there was that opportunity that we could actually use private finance. Um, so that, that came at a, at a later stage. I think we, we did definitely put our feelers out there, try to get interest, but didn't really realize how important it was until we got the deal. And then mm -hmm. when we got the deal, it was like, all right, now we really need to get serious about this and find that um, additional financial support from the word go we've literally you know tried to work on that a little bit more before we get the deal instead of the other way around yeah it has become a a, a bigger priority in terms of our business um 
you know, as Susan mentioned, we, we kind of knew that it was required at the beginning, but really had to ramp it up quite quickly. And I think subconsciously our brand has, has presented itself in that way. You know, our logo is sort of, we wanted to, to also sort of indicate growth in, in, in investment uh, through properties. Our, our, our company name, Resolution Property Investments, you know, we wanted people who were potentially going to invest with us realize, you know, they're investing in, in a business that that's our core focus, you know, that, that they're going to invest and receive a return on their investment. Um, you know, we, we, we're not just a, a sort of a, um, a business uh, where they, you know, they might or might not get a return. So in terms of ramping up, it's probably, and I suppose that's, that's, that's the point in, in any business really is, is, you know, you've only got so much time and you've got to kind of focus on certain things. And yes, we, we're trying to focus a lot more on, on raising investment. Um, but then you have, you sort of find yourself going back to your projects that you're busy working on. Uh, so it, yeah. it's very difficult to be able to, to give it the attention it, it really does need. Mm -hmm. And that is to consistently try raise um, investment during the course of our journey rather than just as and when a deal comes along and right here we got a deal you know the word i've just picked up on there richard is consistency and i totally agree i think so much about building a successful and sustainable portfolio or business is about consistency and if you recognize that finance and raising finances is is, is a key priority because of course without that it's for some people difficult to actually scale then consistently working and opening doors and moving that forwards is really, really important. And I think that that's one of the things that a lot of people struggle with because sometimes it doesn't happen overnight. Sometimes it is incredibly hard work. Sometimes you get let down, you get disappointed, things just fall over. And, um, and it's hard sometimes to just get back on the horse. But for me, I think you're so right in that you always have to be prioritizing that. You always have to be consistent in taking action. And I had another question for you, and I think you've already answered it. We're going to ask it anyway. What, in your opinion, is the order that you should do this? And I ask this to different people, and I have to get different answers. And I don't think there's a right or wrong. I think it's just interesting to hear different people's thoughts. But do you get the finance first, or do you get the deals first? <laughs> I suppose there's a theory and there's a practice. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in theory... Uh, yes, you'd like to be able to to have the finance ready, uh, you know, have those conversations, have the investors lined up and they say, yes, Richard, Susan, you know, we've, we've got money waiting. Tell us when it's ready and, and we'll go. But <laughs> yeah. this, that doesn't always happen because I think, you know, the investors also wanting to to see what they're investing in. Um, you know, as much as they, they trust us, I think there's also, you know, they'd, they'd like to see what the tangible investment is going to be. So we've got investors who, who have invested not specifically in a project they have invested on a, on a fixed term interest and we're able to use those funds in variable you know in, in different um, projects um, but i think with larger amounts of money uh, the investor wants to know or see that the actual project and uh, that's where the practice comes in, into play is is generally what ends up happening is you find the deal you do the numbers you present it to the investor they go yes or no you know <laughs> I think what we're saying is there's no real exact science to it, isn't it? And sometimes it's just the way the cookie crumbles. And yeah. I, I think it, I, you know, I think it's really important to, like you say, be consistent and always be focusing on that. In the same way that in my business, we're always consistent in the way that we manage the properties and keeping on top of tenants and keeping occupancy up. Um, we're consistent with social media. We're consistent with having conversations with investors. We're consistent with actually doing deals and showing people what we're doing. But that doesn't mean that there's always a deal for an investor there ready and waiting. And sometimes we've got to have conversations and we've got to nurture those investors and we've got to keep them warm, but we've also got to be transparent. And then sometimes there's lots of deals there and we've got to kind of try and pull it all together. And sometimes our, those investors actually have gone on and done other things because that's just sometimes the way it works. So it's, it's really interesting to hear your honest opinion and experience of that. And it's good to hear you say that, well, <laughs> there might be an ideal, it often doesn't quite work like that. <laughs> Exactly. I think this is a great conversation to have and one that I wasn't actually expecting to have with you guys because I didn't anticipate just how much you do prioritize finance. And I know Richard, before we kind of kicked off and even in your case study, you mentioned that investing in HMOs and, and property was, was part of a pension plan for you guys as well. So um, it's really interesting to see how strategic you've been about this component. Um, before we move on to your case, which I'm really, really excited to talk about, I want to ask you about 
how things currently look now in terms of your project pipeline and where you see this whole thing going. Is it is it just an investment plan or do you think that this has got legs to be something more exciting, maybe a kind of fully fledged business for you at some point? What's the plan? Well, um, the plan originally was just kind of beef up the pension pot. Um, <laughs> but now we've kind of, we're, we're now that we've learned so much about what property has to offer, we've now realized that um, it can literally, there's just so many benefits. So we are currently um, building our pro uh, property portfolio um, and to run as a business. So we're working on systemization, as as you said, we're working on a sort of the consistency of all the different, um, different areas of property. And yeah, we just uh, want to keep on growing and, and, and scaling up because we just believe that, you know, this is just a wonderful vehicle to give us the financial security for our family at the end of the day so it's not just literally the pension part it's something that we can uh, benefit from the capital appreciation as well as the passive income to do the things that we want to do like traveling and giving um, our children experiences um, as well as to leave a legacy behind for them so the property does that it also gives us other avenues to earn an income stream like a uh, project management and interior design. So property just ticks so many boxes for us. Um, it's very, very exciting. So really amazing. And I think what's also really clear is that that passion for it and enthusiasm just sort of oozes out of you. And I think that's so important when you're doing this because it isn't all easy, is it? And actually, when we start talking about your case study, I think you're going to tell us, well, I'm certainly going to ask you about some of the stuff that, that wasn't that easy. <laughs> I mean, reading your case, was brilliant. And I actually, I think this is one of the best case studies I've ever read. Uh, and I'm not talking specifically about the numbers. The numbers are great, but I'm actually talking about the stuff that you shared and you highlighted in there. And there were so many things in your case today. I thought, wow, that is so true. Like, I can't tell you how many times that that has happened to us. And actually, that's a really, really good learning point. So what I'll, I'm going to give everyone an overview of the deal. And then I've got a few questions I want to ask you about this deal. So... Um, you purchased a building for 185000 and you spent over £100,000 refurbing this. So this was not by any stretch of the imagination a small refurb, a walk in the park. This was a big project. So you know, I, I, I would consider anything over fifty, sixty thousand 60000 quite a big, big project. Um, so your all-in costs were over 300000 in the end. Your stamp duty is obviously um, pretty expensive. <laughs> and you got it revalued at... 350. So you got a really nice, good capital gain on that that project. I think you made sort of in the region of about 40,000 just on the capital value. And I'm really interested to talk to you about that specifically. So we'll come back to that in a second. But gross rents, almost 50,000. It's an amazing. So this is a seven bed, isn't it? Which I know is actually part of your really focused strategy. And after all costs, net cash flow, 26. Twenty-six and a half thousand pounds. So this is a really, really powerful deal, and I think the return on the capital that you invested into the deal in the end was fifty-three percent. So this is a fantastic case study, and uh, I know you guys listening can't see it, but trust me, go to the roadmap and have a look because the pictures will blow you away. It is mega. It's amazing. So uh, where should we start? Let's first of all start with. Why seven beds? Because actually you also mentioned in your case today that this, in fact, I think the next two projects that you've got lined up are also going to be seven beds, aren't they? Yeah. Which is really interesting because seven beds is actually, we're into sui generis, we're, you know, we're into planning permission. So that is not where most people start. And it, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it takes lots of objections and problems that you can encounter. So I guess the first question I've got is why seven beds? Um, I think purely from a business point of view, um, to maximize the, the GDV of the project and, and the, 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 the property as a whole, you know, I think you've got, you've got this, this blank canvas and you want to make the most out of it. Um, you're spending money on, on buying it. And so you want to be able to get the most out of it. And, you know, we were looking for properties that, that could give us a large number of bedrooms, whether it was six or seven. But the ones that we found, we were able to get seven bedrooms out of them with, um, you know, adding extensions on or going into the loft. And it just worked out quite well that way. Um, look, it obviously didn't 
come easy. We we really had to, you know, yeah. rack our brains to to get everything to fit in and make sure all our rooms had on suites because that was an important point. We wanted to make sure rooms had on suites, rooms that were big enough. We wanted to have studios put in a, a kitchenette. Um, so yeah, the first point is is maximizing the value of the property, getting a greater uh, GDV, getting a greater sort of return on investment at the end of the day. Uh, that obviously you know, made our lives a little bit more difficult, as you say, in terms of planning. Uh, getting planning. <laughs> and, you know, I think that, that that was a challenge that we wouldn't have uh, confronted on our own uh, without, you know, the, the support that, that we'd, we'd sort of surrounded ourselves with. And, and we could probably have a chat about that. Um, but it's, we, we, we then were confident enough to, to go ahead with, with planning. Um, and luckily on the first one, it went through relatively smoothly. Uh, we had some objections from, from um, residents in the street, um, mm -hmm. but we, we managed to have good conversations with them uh, and got the, the planning through. The next one, not so easy. It, <laughs> it went to committee. So this is a little wracking. What have we done? Um, but we managed to get that one through as well. You bought this unconditionally. You bought this and then pursued planning or did you offer subject to planning how did it work uh yes that is a that is a conversation that comes up a lot uh in our in our property community you know um and, it, and it, again it's it's sort of i think case by case dependent on on the the vendor of the seller um and i think in this scenario and in most scenarios you should have a plan b um i don't think you you'd want to go in purchasing based solely on the fact that you know, your numbers only work on a seven bed. Mm -hmm. If you were in that scenario and it could only work as a seven bedroom HMO, you'd have to put your offer in um, subject to getting planning. Yeah. And I think in a lot of cases that just makes the, the, the deal a lot harder to sell to the, to the vendor that they're, they're probably not going to accept that. So we were able to, to make offers on these properties um, knowing that we, need, we wanted to get planning, but if we didn't, We'd, we'd be able to make it work on a six bed or put in a planning application a at a later stage. stage. Okay. So it's really interesting. So you have almost built that, that risk into the price that you've offered and, and been willing to pay. And I think that that's so important because it's an obvious question, isn't it? How did you know it was going to get seven beds? If you didn't get seven beds, what do you do? Because you've brought private investment in. How does that work? And I guess you've also had to have transparent conversations with your investor and manage their expectations. Is that is that how you did this? Yes. Yeah. We've we've had those conversations, um, and we've we've been through the process together with our with our investors. You know, we've we've had to say, um, well, our planning application is going to committee. <laughs> it it might or might not come out as a seven bed. You know, and and they they were with us uh, throughout that whole process, understanding. Mm -hmm. um, and I think. That's the important thing is to be able to to have that that communication, uh, that conversation, be able to have that conversation and, and have a joint venture partner that's that's willing to work with you through these difficulties and not just expect sort of golden goose at the end. You know? I, I, I think that's solid advice and I couldn't agree more. Um, and so seven bed all on suites. And that was obviously a very conscious decision. I'm assuming this is a professional let, isn't it? Yes, that's right. Yeah. OK. And um, did you did you recognize before going into this project that it had to be on suites? Was that, was that a clear part of the strategy for you is, is having on suites in your professional HMOs almost part of your product? Yes. Um, we knew that there was great demand in the area for on suites. Um, and given the year that we've already had on suites became even more, <laughs> um, more important than ever. Um, obviously from a hygienic point of view and having an area where people are feeling safe um, in air in the space um, so en suites was definitely um, a plus for us um, and it was really a, important that we did manage to get at least most of them have en suites so yeah definitely well it certainly sounds and looks like you've created a, a really top quality product and um, no doubt your tenants are gonna gonna lo love living here. I mean, I'm just looking at the photos, I can't stop looking at them, mm. they're so good. Let's talk about some of the stuff then that was challenging. And um, let's start with the with the finance bit. So in your case study, you guys said an interesting one we talked, when I asked you about values just, just a little while ago, why the seven beds, you talk about maximizing the value. And I know you guys 
um, really are quite focused on that commercial valuation. And this is a question I get asked all the time. But most of the time people are asking it about four beds and five beds and six beds. And the advice I usually give them is, look, it's, it's, pro it's not impossible to get some sort of commercial lending on that based on the, 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 the net and gross rental valuations, but it's not easy. When you start venturing into the seven beds and more, it is a little bit easier, but still not easy. And uh, it doesn't sound like it was easy for you guys as well. So um, can you tell us a little bit about that? How are you actually making these valuations stack up? How are you actually making, because I guess this is a key part of your strategy, isn't it? Getting that elevated valuation, extracting it on a commercial basis. How are you making that work and, and what problems did you encounter with this deal? Um, yeah, I suppose from, from, a, from a starting point of view, for one to be able to get a commercial valuation, it's, it's um, based on a number of factors. I mean, as you can imagine, uh, various lenders will have different uh, considerations and requirements. But generally what we've found is if the house cannot be put back on the market as a house, a single occupancy house, it's better place to have a commercial mortgage. So, I mean, you, it could be it could be a five bedroom house, but as you say, you probably find it very challenging. But if that five bedroom house had all on suites or it was all studios, and there's if if you mm -hmm. sold the house, there was no way you'd be able to sell it as a as a residential a single occupancy house. Then it might be able to be classified or, or be. Um, mortgage on a, on a commercial mortgage valuation. I think seven bedrooms is, is by default commercial valuation, no problem. Six bedrooms, probably more so, but again, additional en suites will, will, will strengthen the case for it to go onto a commercial mortgage. When you got this valued, did you get the value you want the first time? Did you get the lender you wanted first time or did you have to jump through a few hoops to get there? Yes, it's never straightforward, is it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I thought you might say that. Yeah, I think it was probably going to be challenging and and we expected that and we from the beginning we knew we, we needed a brilliant broker and and we have we have a fantastic broker and she's done amazing things mm -hmm. for us and uh COVID or no COVID, we probably would have had a bit of a challenge we might have gone from one lender to the next but with COVID, we, we went through three different lenders um you know where where they, they they were willing to to finance the project and they then midway changed their own internal policies and said Thanks, but no thanks. We're not going to lend on your project anymore. Mm. <laughs> so we had to move on and find another lender. So, so that was challenging uh, finding um, lenders. I, I think you've probably answered it there, Richard. I, you know, I was interested to know whether it was straightforward or not, and I think you're clearly saying it, it wasn't straightforward. You had to go through three different lenders, and you had a great broker, which was obviously key to this. Was there a point where you were worried that that, that, that it might not happen, and you wouldn't get the valuation that you, that you wanted, or were you were you still entirely confident despite? I think because we had joined such a, a good property community with, you know, that had in, in, the, in the core of its sort of philosophy was, was resilience and, and looking for solutions and finding um, solutions to problems and not giving up. Mm. The, where there's a will, there's a way. You know, we, we were quite happy to, you know, or well, not happy, but we, we knew that we would find a way. You know, I think if we didn't have that, we would have probably... Lost, you know, the first lender would have come back to us and said, sorry, you know, not going to happen. We would have thought, you know what, it's COVID. This isn't going to happen for us. This isn't going to work. Let's give up. We'll see in a year's time, see what happens. <laughs> but I think it was very important. And I think that's the, in general with with everything, with everything um, you know, entrepreneurship, um, property, business and whatnot. There's just so many variables and so many factors involved, uh, lending being one of them. And it's just a matter of of finding ways and means to to get to the just outcome being persistent all the time keep pushing keep pushing until you get the desired results at the end yeah i, I want to highlight that as well susan because i think that that word persistence is key as well you know i think the two most important features you know of, of success particularly when, when you're growing a business are consistency and persistence <laughs> and you you said them both today and um uh, i don't often hear a lot of people saying them it's you know it's something that i find myself repeating a lot to people when they're getting frustrated or demotivated by lack of results and progress um, and not seeing the the results they want even though they're doing the right stuff and it, and it is great to hear people like you you say that it doesn't always go smoothly there are issues or a hiccup sometimes you've got to take a step back 
before you can take a step forwards. Sometimes you've got to look at plan Bs. And it really is great to hear you, you talk about persistence there as well. Let's talk about the refurb as well. So obviously this project was amazing. We know it was a £100,000 refurb. So we can imagine immediately that there's a whole lot to keep on top of there. Um, but you said something really interesting um, that, I, that, I've, that I've experienced myself. And I know how incredibly frustrating it can be um, when it's not done properly. And that is um, when you've got plans of the property and you've got rewires happening and plumbing and sockets and switches all to go in the right places. And this was something amongst a number of things that, that you've highlighted as being, being quite challenging. What was the challenge there and, and, and what advice would you give anybody listening who's doing refurbs of this sort of size to, to try and avoid problems that can encounter with that? Because I think the example you gave is, you know, if sockets go in the wrong places, then it can really throw out the whole furniture arrangement. And actually, when you've got things like um, you've got mounted uh, lights by the bedsides and things like that, haven't you? So absolutely critical. <laughs> if, uh, if they're on the wrong side of the room, then it's going to a little bit look a bit peculiar with the bed over there. So, um, what challenges did you have, and what advice would you give to people to try and avoid this? I think the the important thing is um, having a good set of drawings, and uh, that that's always been my focus. And I, and I've I've realised that you know from my from my uh, professional background and and just sort of moving that over into into uh, building. So I don't necessarily have a building background, but I know the importance of having a good set of drawings that everybody can work from and, and there's no confusion about that. Yes, there's going to be changes along the way. Uh, you know, we might decide to change things around and and we ch if, if, for example, we moved, we decided the bed's going to be better located on the other side of the room, then we will update the drawing, issue that to the builder and, you know, they should then be in the right position. But that didn't end up being the case. <laughs> so, you know, I suppose the advice is have good, good set of drawings that is very clear as to where everything is. I uh, don't take it for granted that the builder knows where a light switch will go. I mean, I've I've been to, to to somebody else's property where the, the you know the electrician decided to put the light switch in, in an extremely arbitrary place that nobody would have ever thought to look for a light switch when you walk into the to the room. So drawings number one, number two is then the communication with the builder. Is very important, um, and and I I tried my best, you know, to communicate that to the builder in in written form as well as conversations. So if we had a conversation saying, right, we need to to change this plug position, I'd show it on the drawing, give it to them, and hopefully they pass it on to the electrician or the plumber, which wasn't always the case. <laughs> so so the third point is then following up. And then mm. being on site uh, and checking because as, as much as you'd, you'd expect your builder to do that for you, you know, these, these things would probably appear to be trivial to the, to the builder and they just want to get on with it. Mm. But for you, they're very important because it's your project. And at the end of the day, you know, you've designed it to accommodate specific furniture in exact locations. Mm. And if it doesn't work out, you've got to deal with the problems. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I think there's a few things there in what you said. Obviously, reducing the amount of work and duplications that you've got to do by having good and accurate plans, managing builders effectively, but also it's clear just how much you guys prioritize not only the design, but the management of the space itself. And I think in professional HMOs, particularly more so after the last 12 months, that's so important. I, I you know, I've found that just the way that you arrange furniture can really change the dynamic of a house and it can either encourage them to be as one and, and cohesive and, and cook and clean and, and kind of gel, or it can do the opposite and it, it, it can make it difficult for them to do that. And it can almost make tenants a bit more reclusive because it doesn't offer that sort of living accommodation. Um, if rooms aren't functional, it's one of the reasons why people will leave if they don't have enough storage or space or just frustrating things like not being able to maneuver around a room or feel like there's enough space are all really important so it's great to hear you talk about that as well i think you guys have dropped some absolute knowledge bombs today and um uh, i've really really enjoyed recording today's episode with you um so for everyone who's listening just a reminder that this case study is over in the hmo roadmap and you can go and listen to it and if you want a bit of help with raising private finance and understanding commercial valuations then there are some courses inside the HMO roadmap as well for that with some real detail. But guys, for anyone who's listening today, 
who's inspired by what you're doing or is potentially interested in working with you. Is there an opportunity and how can they contact you? Right, so yeah, uh, as Susan mentioned, we're very active on social media. So we we have a Facebook page, obviously our personal Facebook pages, which we, we're also quite clear on what we're doing. But our business Facebook page is, is Resolution Property Investments. And we've got that on Facebook and Instagram, uh, as well as LinkedIn. We're, we're yet to develop our own website. Um, but I think the important part is, is having that personal relationship and then broadening our net into 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 exposing ourselves to to the rest of the potential investors so yeah then we've um your interior yeah, design then business I've got the interior design um which just marries really well with what we're doing anyway um and of course you know that service is also available for anyone else looking to sort of make their hmo stand out so that's uh, elevated interiors and there's lots of good tips uh, on there as well so um yeah check it check it out <laughs> Well, thank you so much for coming on to the show, guys. It's been a real pleasure to have you, and I've really enjoyed talking to you about how you've gone about building your portfolio because your story is very unique. A lot of the stories, actually, that, yeah, that we hear on the show are quite unique, and it's great to hear how different people approach things in different ways and, and how there are often more than one way to crack that nut. So thank you so much for coming on and, and sharing your story and sharing this amazing case study with us.